avoiding. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Meredith. I have been crocheting since the 1970s. And at some point in time, I came to the realization that it's all basically one principle. If you can hold your yarn, you can hold your hook. If you yarn over and pull up a loop, you can pretty much do anything. All these things are common to see that I get people through, that I get comfortable. And I can watch on Monday from Friday around this time, 9.45, 10 o'clock, Eastern time in the United States. And I do a tutorial, uh, one project a week. It's usually free-handed, so it's something that um, I can show you how I work through my thought process so that you can take those basic principles and you can kind of work through them to customize the things that you want to make as well uh, so that you can see that it really does just all consist of holding your yarn, holding your hook, yarning over and coming up with a loop. So my normal routine is to get that speech while I am uh, making my coffee and dog, Sir Charles. Those of you that have been with me know Sir Charles. No, so Sir Charles very well. Um, and then I'm going to jump in. And what you see there on the screen is the pink bag is a French market tote. Tutorials one through four have been uploaded to YouTube. I have the free pattern for that doll, and I also have accessory pieces if you wanted to make a cow, or a giraffe, or a bunny, um, and that is knit, just Nifty Knots, N-I-F-T-Y-K-N-O-T-Z dot com. It's not a blog site. You're not going to get inundated with ads. It is just simply like my portfolio page, and I have a few patterns that are available. Uh, the other tutorials that we've done so far have puppets <clears throat> and I have the pattern for the base, two basic puppets. One has a pointy nose if you want to make like a shark or a mouse or a fox. One has a rounded nose if you want to make like a cow or a goat or a dog. Um, those are tutorials that I've done as well including uh, the sh my shark puppet from beginning to end and the shark puppet goes through here's my copy and the shark puppet goes through working some short rows so that you can shape the fins. It also goes through how I make three-dimensional teeth in my shark. Uh, let's see, some of the other tutorials I've done are the granny square bags, and I'll show you those as soon as I sit down. Uh, the granny square bags, I show you how to, a lot of them have skulls in them, and I show you how to make that motif in the center skull or the bunny uh, pop so that you get a nice crisp line around your motif before you actually work the rest of the granny square around it. And I do the same thing with the bunny. And I also go into explaining how you can adjust those patterns so that you can either make them tilted so you can make the granny square totes or how you can make them just a straight up granny square, which is square um, if you wanted to make uh, a blanket or such. So those are some of the tutorials. Uh, another tutorial was how I stitch together the granny square totes. Another tutorial was how I do the decorative stitching on the tops of them. Um, I didn't really do a tutorial about how to line them because 
sewing isn't exactly my uh, primary choice of things that I'm like really, really good at. Uh, but I did show you the linings in my bag so that if you wanted to line them, you had some sort of idea of how I did it. Uh, last week's tutorial was a bolero shrug, and you can't quite see that yet. That is on my mannequin that will be behind me as soon as I sit down. <coughs> and that bolero shrug, I go through exactly how you would figure out your starting chain, uh, how you could make a mesh like mine is. I also go through uh, how you can customize the size and how you would work the pattern if you use different st solo stitches instead of a mesh stitch. I went through how to add cuffs to the sleeves, uh, different, cu different couple types of cuffs so you could work the sleeves. Uh, I also went through fluted sleeves or flared sleeves if you wanted to flare your sleeves. Uh, and then I went ahead and put beads on it. So that is the mannequin that I'll move right behind me. I have one of the arms pinned up so that you can see it. But it's basically just a scarf with the ends stitched up like sleeves. So it fits around your shoulders like a shrug. And fits around your shoulders like a shrug. And then the sleeves come down. And good morning, everybody. Here's my Cindy. So that is my shrug in the background there. You can see hanging on my mannequin. And it is just a basic sweater. I should put it a little bit closer so you can see it. Uh, that is just a basic scarf pattern with the sleeves um, stitched up. I don't know how much closer I can get this here in my little corner. <clears throat> so that maybe you can see it. So you can see how it just drapes across your shoulders and then the sleeve hangs. So that is the tutorial that we did last week. And this week's tutorial was the French market tote that's behind me, <clears throat> which is equally as easy and pretty much the same stitch. My tutorials go through stitch by stitch and show you how to make those stitches. Um, so if you don't know the names of the stitches, I'm going to show you how to do them anyway. Good morning. Good morning, Glenda. Good morning, Tammy. Good morning, Cindy. Good morning, Diane. And today, since we were finished with the market tote, <clears throat> let me try to untangle what's left here of this skein of yarn. Um, since we were finished with the French market tote, if you noticed on my YouTube channel there, I have um, a little card pocket wallet that I have looped around the handles of my market tote there. So I figured we'd do that today and kind of tie things in. Um, I also jump on in the evenings and the afternoon just to crochet and just to kind of hang out and chat with everybody because I like to just chat with everybody too. Like the mornings, my mornings have turned into tutorials and then, but I miss the chatter. So I like to jump back in later and see all you guys that jump back on and sit here and chatter with me and just have a good time just doing our thing. I need to grab my water. My coffee was a little bit too hot. Before I started losing my voice here while I'm trying to teach. But a sip is good. All right. <clears throat> so. The little card pocket that I used was actually really simple. It wasn't even lined. It was just so you could put like your card in so that you can hang it off. Because most people don't use cash anymore. They just use a card. Good morning, Michelle. <coughs> um, my voice isn't cooperating yet. And I'm using the same end of. This is what I had left over from that skein. Isn't that pretty? I'm just kidding. Um, this is what I had left over from the skein that I used 
for the French market tote and the skein that I used for the French market tote was uh, this is my favorite yarn to use for the French market totes like I have a different yarn that I like to use for different things and this is the yarn that I like to use for my French market totes and it is super saver ombre and it this color is anemone and this is the skein before I started and I started with a brand new skein and when I was done this is what I had left over <clears throat> so I'm gonna go show you how to make I make one of those little simple card pouches if you like what you see I'm gonna move my chair again and you're not getting studio quality from me you're getting everyday life uh, here's some of my other market bags and my granny totes that I've done. I have some with skulls on them. I have the ones with the bunnies on them. I kind of had to move things around because it was getting too heavy on that. There you can see the bunny. It was getting a little bit too heavy on that one uh, corner there of my clothes rack. And if you like the tutorials, please feel free to go to my YouTube channel and Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. It might cost you here to subscribe, but it doesn't cost you there to subscribe. And <clears throat> it just helps me out. All right. So, with our basic principle, if you can hold your yarn and you can hold your hook, if you can yarn over and you can pull through a loop, you're going to be able to do this. So that loop that we just pulled through is our chain stitch. And I'm going to start with my chain stitch. And I'm going to make it easy so it's like a no-sew. Six. I'm going to just start chaining 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And 15 to me looks like that's going to be big enough. And if I could, you know, I have everything around me except the measuring tape. Which I should probably have so I can show you guys the sizes. Let me grab my ruler real quick. cutting ruler. All right. So I did 15 chains here. Is that right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And you can see those 15 chains are, you might be able to see, I can hold this backwards. I can hold this backwards and you can actually see the numbers, I think. Maybe. One, two, three, four. I don't know how well it'll focus, but you can see that my 15 chains, if they're not stretched, if they're not stretched, it's about four inches, four and a half inches. If I stretch it out a little bit, it's going to be five inches. But when I start to, good morning, everyone, Patty. Um, but once I start to do my single crochets, my single crochets tend to be a little bit tighter than my initial chain, uh, which is fine because my initial chain is going to be the base and we're actually going to start um, working in rounds around that chain. You're going to let the beastie out real quick. If I don't jump up and grab him as soon as he walks to the door. Come on. That issue becomes my issue and I'm not real happy about it. Go ahead. Go. Nice. Sorry about that. <coughs> Again. You don't get studio quality. You get everyday life and a decent tutorial for me. At least I like to think they're decent tutorials. All right, so I chained 15. 15 is gonna be my base chain for this uh, project. Turn on my light so I can see. Doesn't really make a difference on the camera, I think, but it's behind me so I can see. <clears throat> okay, so my base chain is 15. How many times can I say that? I'm sure. Uh, I am going to chain one more 
and that's going to give me the height to begin my single crochets. So I'm going to take my single crochets and I'm just going to work them in the top loop. So this is the way you're looking at it. This is the way you're looking at it. And I'm just going to take my hook and I'm going to insert it into the top loop. That's pulled too tight. There you go. Just into the top loop. Just into the top loop. Here, if I insert it from the back. Just into the top loop just into the top loop and you're going to work all the way down that chain. So it should be 15 stitches because you're going to skip that first stitch for the height. Um, I would say put a stitch marker in that first stitch because you're going to start working in spirals and that way you know where your first stitch is. So that's my first stitch into my chain of 15. And I'm going to work the rest of the 15, 2, 3, and I'm just doing single crochets, 4, and a single crochet is insert your hook, yarn over, pull it through once, yarn over and pull it through 2. Insert your hook, yarn over, pull it through once, and then pull it through both of those loops. So that would be your single crochet, and you're going to do 15 of those across. I have to adjust my camera here so you guys can see me without me like reaching for the stars. It's pretty amazing how my dog's become just this, has become the celebrity here. Okay, so I did 15 across. I'm going to go let him in. Don't do anything else yet. Because we're not going to change. We're not going to change. We're not going to go backwards. We are going to just continue working in the row. Okay. So get. You got your treats. Get. Okay. So we have worked our 15 chains across just in the top loop and now you can see where if you turn it upside down which is what you're going to do you can see the top loops from the chain from the other side of the chain you're going to work one single crochet and I know it pulls a little bit tight for that first stitch but that's okay um, you're going to work one single crochet in each one of those top loops down the other side of the chain so you're just going to flip it upside down. So that's how I worked it. That's how I worked it. And I'm just going to flip it upside down. And I'm going to start in this stitch here. And I'm just going to work my 15 chains back. Make sense? Is everybody with me? So one, two, and I, if you know me, I like to work over my tails, three, four, five. It may look like you're getting a big gap there with the stitch that you're currently working, but when you work the next stitch, it's actually going to pull it tight and anchor it. So the tail is going to end up being in the middle. So you're working, you're working your chain, you're working your chain, I should get a Sharpie for that, huh? Instead of a pencil. Where's, oh, here's my Sharpie. Make sure there's nothing on the other page of that. Okay, so you're gonna work You're going to work your chain. I'm going to see if I can draw without actually looking at the phone. So you're going to make your chain. This is going to be your slip knot in your tail. And then you're going to take your chain and you're going to do your 15 stitches. <laughs> then 
there's 10 there, but in the top loop of that chain, and then you're going to flip your chain upside down, and then you're going to work your same stitches, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten is just for demonstration purposes, and I know this looks crappy, but um, so then you're going to work your ten all the way down, so your tail is actually coming out here. So you have worked this way. You have worked this way. You have worked up and around this way, and you have worked to the end of your chain again. Better? Does that make sense? My horrible drawing. I could draw a better diagram if I was actually looking at it instead of just trying to look for my look through my phone there. But that is kind of how you're going to do it. You're going to start with your starting chain. And there's your tail, so this is your slip knot, and you're going to chain 15 across, and then you're going to do 15 slip stitches. You're going to flip your work this way, so you're still looking at the same right side, and you're just going to do 15 stitches down the other side. And that's how you're going to do that. Um, it's my preference to take that tail and run it through here when I do those top set of stitches, just so that I don't have to weave them in later just my preference. You don't have to do that. You can just leave that tail there and weave it in later if you want to. Thank you. Uh, let's make sure I still have all my stuff here. Okay, so now I'm working back down with my 15 stitches. Let me recount here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I'm going to keep working down there. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I hate working into a foundation chain, but it works. Eleven, twelve. 13, 14, getting that last one there, 15. Okay, let me cut this tail off so that it's not getting in the way of what I'm trying to show you. Okay, so now you have made your chain down the center, and this was your starting stitch. You did 15 across. You did not add any extras. You just flipped it, and you did 15 more across the other side. I'm using um, a, six, a six millimeter, same as I used for the uh, body of the bag. If you want it tighter, you can make it tighter. Uh, it's really simple to work up, so, you know, if you wanted to take the couple minutes to rip it out if you don't like the size of it. But this is this is kind of like the size that I like. That way, if you wanted to put a couple cards in there, you could put dollar bills in there. You could probably actually put um, coins in there as well without it being lined, and it wouldn't um, fall through the bottom or fall through the holes. Um, so that is so far the first round that I have. And then... You'll see how simple this is. This is my hook. This was my very, my hook is in my last stitch. My stitch marker is in my first stitch. I am going to, without turning my work, just put my next first stitch right into that first stitch. So let me take my stitch marker out. So into that same first stitch, you're not going to turn your work. You're not going to add any extra stitches. You're not going to add any extra stitches to the side. You're just going to put your hook through that very first single crochet that you did. Hi, Rose Queen. And you're going to make your first stitch again. And I'm going to put my stitch marker there to mark my first stitch so that I know that that's my first stitch. 
So now at this point, you have 30 stitches around and you're just going to keep going around in a circle. So you're just going to keep doing your 30 stitches. Four, five, six. And again, I'm doing a single crochet, which is insert my hook, yarn over, pull it through once, and you have two loops on the hook. I pull it through both loops both loops on the hook and that finishes your single crochet. I um, show it because I'm using uh, US terms and US terms are a little bit different from UK terms. So I, even though I'm telling you single crochet, I want to show you as well so that you, um, so that you kind of get the gist of what I'm talking about and you're not using, because if you were using U, uh, UK terms, a single crochet would actually be what we call in the United States a single crochet. Single crochet. Did I say that right? A single, what we consider a single crochet in Amer U.S. standard American terms um, would be a slip stitch to people in the U.K. So if you said single crochet to somebody in the UK who used UK terms, they would think you were referring to a slip stitch. Um, single crochet in American terms are a little bit different. So that's that's uh, why I like to show the stitches as well. Not only that, but I'm just showing you how simple it is. Now, it might be a little bit tough to get around the very corner, but the first time, after the first time or two you go around that, it won't be. If you need to flip your hook over so that you can hook it, hook your stitch this way to get your stitch to get your hook into that stitch, sometimes that works a little bit better than just trying to like push it through there for those tighter stitches. But you are just going to work all the way around. Again, it's still the same 30 stitches that we started with. 15 up one side of the chain, 15 down the other side of the chain. And you're just going to keep doing that. I'm going to, there you go. I'm going to keep doing that until I get around to my first stitch. My first stitch is marked. And I'm not going to turn or anything. You can see how it's starting to cinch up on the ends like a bag. So I'm not going to turn or anything. I'm just going to take that stitch marker out. I'm going to make my first stitch for the next round. Replace my stitch marker so I know where my first stitch is. My end is poking out there where I will whatever my ends. And then I'm going to go around again. And I'm just going to do another. And you can see how it's starting to come together. That would be the bottom where we did our chain. And you can see how it's starting to come together as a uh, just bag without having so you won't have to sew this together you will not have to sew the sides of this together you're just going to work up pretty much as much rows as you want to work up you could do the same thing to make a uh, pouch big enough for a cell phone you could use the same technique to make uh, a larger purse when I make my uh, star stitch crossbody bags this is the same technique I use. I work everything in a round and I start with a starting chain. And I just keep going around in circles. I'm going to say I'm probably going to end up doing seven or ten rounds. So this is three so far that I'm finishing up here. And again, I'm just single crocheting all the way around even. Again, I get to my first stitch. 
I'm going to take my, whoops, I missed a stitch. I get to my first stitch, which is on the corner. I'm just going to take my stitch marker out. I'm going to single crochet into that first stitch. And I'm going to place my stitch marker back in that first stitch so I can keep track of where my stitch markers are. And then you can see even more that it's coming together like a bag. So you're just going to keep working around in circles. Um, six, eight, nine. I'll probably do ten rounds around here. So if you guys want to sit and chatter, you guys can sit and chatter and talk. How is everybody this morning? And I'm, I'm just still doing the same thing. I'm just going around in circles, doing my same 30 stitches. How's everybody's morning? I hope it's good. They're doing construction somewhere around here. I can hear the beep beep of the trucks. <clears throat> So they're either doing constructions or the power companies out cutting trees or out of lines. Although they, us they usually do that before now. Just because by the time it gets to, um, I am doing good. I'm doing really good this morning, actually. I am doing very, very well. My husband yesterday, if you guys were, you, I know you were here, Cindy, but I was talking about getting just like a burner phone that I could use as a small tablet so I can like reference things when you guys ask. And um, hook size hook I use. I use, I don't know if you can see it. It's a six millimeter. And you can, you can use any size hook you want. If you wanted to make the stitches really smaller and really tighter, um, you could just uh, um, increase the amount of chains that you use to get that four to five inches with a smaller size hook and a tighter tension. And then you would just do the same thing. You, you would work down one side with your single crochet, work over the other side with your single crochet, and then just keep going around in circles. So you can use whatever stitch um, or whatever size hook you really wanted to use depending on how tight you wanted your little bag to be. But I'm just using a six because that's what I used for the majority of the bag. And I'm probably gonna do 10 rounds around this, which will probably give me enough. And then after you do your 10 rounds, you're not going to fasten off. I'm going to show you how to make just the little flap for it. And mine that I had done previously, I did a little flap for it with a little ch chain loop on the very end of it with like, you know, envelope style with a little chain loop on the end of it. So the flap folds over um, and I put a button there. And I will get to all that during this because this is a pretty quick project. You could line it if you wanted. And I will show you how you would measure your lining if you wanted to put a lining in it. You could make it a zipper pocket if you wanted. Uh, I mean, this is just a basic way to make any size bag. any size like basic bag that you really didn't want a like I don't want an actual bottom to this bag I just want it to be like a pocket so any bag that you wanted to be like a pocket and you can see how it's coming around it's flat so there really isn't any dimension to the very bottom of it just enough that you could put like cards and money or something like that in um, so using that chain method and working around is a great way to start just like a little change purse bag or uh, a little cell phone pouch. You could take yourself. I don't have an extra one yet. My husband's like, oh, I'll bring you one home. I'm like, oh, you're so sweet. But you could make like this tall enough to be a cell phone pouch. 
and then you could actually just chain up and around and um, have a strap if you wanted. And this is a good basic way to start um, a nice simple bag. Whether it was this size, whether it was cross body size, and I'm not digging through my bins just yet, but my cross body bags, I know you've probably seen them in my TikTok videos, um, are made from cotton. And I start them the same way, only the rounds that I do instead of doing my single crochet, I do my star stitch rounds. So I know he's so sweet. I, I would do my star stitch across. So I would do the first round of my star stitch. And then for the second round, I would just go keep going all the way around on the uh, right side of it. So if you wanted to do this as like a half double crochet, you could go around this in half double crochets. If you want to go around this in a seed stitch, you could do the same thing and go around it in seed stitch. Uh, what other straight stitches are there? Uh, double crochets. If you wanted to just go around it with a double crochet, you could do the same thing. Um, I can't think off the top of my head. Let me consult my Ziploc bag of miscellaneous pages. Uh, let's see, what other stitches could you use to do that? Uh, you could pro I don't know if you could use the Tunisian stitches to do that because it's worked in the round and you wouldn't be able to like really get your hook around that curve to keep going around. Um, let's see, what other stitches could you use to do that little bag here to make a difference? Um, these are motifs. Those pages are upside down. Uh, tapestry stitches. You could definitely use tapestry stitches if you wanted. Um, we've got like, these are other stitches you could do like different. You could do like, what is that? Uh, Rocky Road Bobbles, Starry Eyes, um, Offset bobbles, puff stitch lace, baguettes, uh, any stitch that's like a straight stitch that you can manage to manipulate the ends so that you can um, just chain a couple of chains for the height and then uh, do your second row. Um, what else is there? Shell stitches are kind of funny when you're working them because then you have to like slip stitch over your shells. I'm looking for some straight stitches that would be decent enough that you could do. Um, you could do like an alternating post. You would just then, when you got to the end of your round, have to join it with a slip stitch and then uh, chain for the height of your stitch. Uh, so you could do like post stitches if you wanted to add some texture to that. Uh, what else do I have here? Those again are post stitches. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, you could do any of these stitches as long as you had um, enough chains. Uh, what is that? That's a flying shell. I'm not looking for shell stitches. I'm looking for just straight stitches. Again, again, you could use shell stitches. You would just have to count out your chains so that you would be able to finish your shells. Slip, sti slip stitch to the top of your shell and start the next round. Um, oh, here's some stitches that would work well with that. You could use these stitches. Um, that's a griddle stitch which looks like it's a half double crochet, single crochet, half double crochet, single crochet, and then you alternate. Uh, over your single crochet, you would do your half double crochet. Over your half double crochet, you would do your single crochet. Um, this one is a crumpled griddle. 
which looks like they just do the single crochets over the single crochets and the double crochets over the double crochets. Uh, this is some sort of rib stitch. I would have to look at that. Um, Here's a granule stitch. Like anything that was pretty much, anything with a tighter stitch that's pretty much um, like a flat stitch. And you would just then have to um, pay attention to your uh, counting chain. But I showed you how, just chain a few extras if you're not sure what you need for your starting chain. And then uh, when you get to it, you can just, um, well, that would, be, that would be a little bit difficult to take that out. But you could do one side and then do the other side so you would know how many. Like, you would have to experiment with exactly how many starting chains you needed to, to do that complete stitch pattern. Um, if that makes sense. But that's not hard to do. You do your first chain and you just kind of experiment. You just kind of doodle along with your... Uh, uh, different stitches that you wanted to do until you had enough stitches that you can make it all the way around with the pattern um, and then chain to give you your height for the second row and then just do your second or third row however many rows there are to that stitch um, you would just want to make sure you uh, slip stitch to the beginning and then change your height for your next stitch was that too much? Or did all that kind of make sense? I'm surprised that star stitch isn't in that book. Or if it is, they must call it something different. But I am going to go around here for 10, 10 stitches. But yeah, basically any um, any stitch that you could work in a row, you could manage to work in this round like this. You would just have to fiddle with the end of it, doodle with the end of it to make sure um, you got it so that it was even and ended at the end of the stitch pattern. I don't know about where you are, but it is beautiful here today. It's a good day when I can have my windows open this early. Listen to the birds. Even my dog seems calm so far. Hello, Melissa. Thank you for joining. I am working on like a little card pouch, little change purse type pouch. Um, this was the market bag tote that I did this week that was a tutorial. Uh, the French market totes. And in the thumbnail on my YouTube channel, this was the color that I used. So I'm just using up the rest of it. In the thumbnail that I used on my YouTube channel, it has like this little card pouch that hangs off the side of it. Um, so I'm using up the rest of the yarn that I have left from that skein to just make one of those little card pouches. It's nice here in California today. Oh, good. I'm ready. I'm so ready for the sun every day. Although I find the older I get, the more I have to like limit my direct sun exposure, even with sunscreen on. Which is a little bit disappointing, but I have enough places that I can sit outside that are shady where I can still be in the sun. Or at least still be outside while the sun is nice. I like it when it's nice and warm spite of the fact that I moved north. Um, the rest of my family, though, 
forget it. So in the summertime, almost as soon as they get up, they turn the air conditioning up and I run outside. So I sit in the heat and they can sit in the nice cold house. And that's what I do. I sit there all day. Not all day. You guys see my attention span. I sit for a few minutes and decide something needs weeded or something needs planted or something needs rearranged. And then I have to like get up and do that. And I totally forgot to put my stitch marker in for my first round the last time. But that's okay because I'll show you how you can count your stitches because you want to end up at the side anyway. So if you forget to put your stitch marker back in, just fold your piece in half. And you can see how it's not quite even here on the top. So I would finish doing this row till I got to the side. Because you are, regardless of where your starting stitch was, you're going to end up on the side to start your flap. It's gardening time to do a little planting. I did some planting. I saw that it was going to be uh, chilly. Um the beginning of the week like over last weekend in the beginning of the week I saw it was going to be chilly like almost freezing and then we were going to get some rain so the couple of beds that I just throw like uh, seeds in like marigolds and uh, zinnias what else do I throw seeds in for nasturtiums things like that so the beds and the pots that are I were going was going to throw seeds into I just um, went up went out those few nice days we had before, prior and I just kind of tilled up that dirt a little bit and just kind of sprinkled my seeds everywhere and then it got cold and then it rained and everything should be nice and ready to germinate by the time it gets sunny again this week um, I've learned that it's easier to garden when I'm not so meticulous about things if the marigolds all come, come, even if only half those marigolds come up, I probably have a couple hundred of them in that one bed. And then I just take them out while they're little. I love all those flower seeds you said. Yeah, I like them too. They're easy to grow and they look pretty. So when my marigolds start to come up, I don't with the zinnias I because I just kind of leave them uh, nasturtiums I've transplanted but I found you have to transplant them when they're like really small because they don't really like to be transplanted um, but I usually try to dig them up when they're small anyway because you know it's not hard to look down and see oh my god I have like 200 marigolds coming up and then I take those marigolds and I just shove them in containers here and there or fill in my garden with them so that I don't have to worry about it Uh, a lot different than I was 10 years ago where I would have like started each seed meticulously and nasturtiums are edible for salads too. Yes, they are. And I found this little tidbit out. If you want to keep the aphids away from the rest of your plants, grow nasturtiums because the aphids love them. And I actually researched it because I went out one day and I thought, oh, I know it stormed and I know it rained really hard and this was like a planter that a big round like big round planter that I have sitting by one of my patio swings and I thought oh did it really rain that hard that it knocked all that dirt up onto these plants because they were all nasturtiums in that pot <laughs> so I looked a little closer and realized that ooh, that's some kind of bug there so I looked it up and found that black aphids like nasturtiums. So if you want to keep black aphids away from a lot of your other garden plants, um, you plant nasturtiums. They are beautiful. Yeah, they are pretty. Put some around your vegetables. Oh, see, so you knew that. See, I didn't know that. So I was like, oh my God. I mean, I'm not kidding you. The leaves were almost totally black on the undersides. 
And I don't usually like to use uh, pesticide, but my mother, when she comes up in the summertime, always brings uh, rose spray to spray her roses uh, so that the beetles don't eat them. So I uh, hijacked her bottle of rose spray and I come over, I came over and like saturated my nasturtiums because I thought, oh my God, all these aphids right beside me. I can't, I can't do this. You know, I don't mind. I'm very tolerant to the bugs, but when there's like, there had to have been thousands of them. I mean, I'm not kidding you. Some of those leaves were totally black. Okay, so let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Oh, that was 12 rows. I just chattered away. And if I turn it to the other side, it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 rows. So I've got 11 rows on this side, 12 rows on the back side. And that looks like that's probably going to be big enough for like a change purse or a card pocket. If I had sit one sitting here. Do I? Um, hmm. Ooh, I just found a pack of needles. You guys have to get a chuckle out of like the stuff that I pull out. Like, I'm not kidding you. This table isn't much more than maybe like 12 inches by maybe like 18 inches. And I have everything that I want to use just stuffed on it. <laughs> Roses carry a lot of aphids. Well, let me tell you what, my roses didn't have aphids that year because I had aphid, I had nasturtiums planted in the front by my rose bushes too, and they didn't. But I did have to go get a beetle bag because the beetles just, oh, they were horrible last year for some reason. Like you would walk outside and the, the beetles would just start dive bombing you. So, okay, so that's 12 rounds. This is approximately the size of a business card, maybe a little bit smaller. So you can see if you put that in there that's about that size let me see i should have a business card somewhere i can shove in there or something that's on the refrigerator or something that's the size of a business card or a credit card um, oh no, those are more care tags Alrighty then. I'm going to swap out my emotional support cup for my coffee. And I have this card here that's about the same size as a credit card. I mean, it's a little bit shorter, but it's about the same size, maybe a little bit bigger than a credit card. And you can see that that fits nicely in that pocket. So you could carry a few cards, a few dollar bills. Uh, things like that. Apparently, apparently nasturtiums attract the aphids so they won't eat the rest of your plants. So you just plant them a little bit further. Like just plant them a little bit further out. You just well stocked your table. Oh my God, you have no idea if you saw this table. Is it just the four of you guys here? Just the four? Uh, well, I'm going to record this, so I'll show you my table later. Um, I'll, Cause I'll upload this to YouTube. Um, I think just the aphids, although I've read that there are other plants. I'm trying to think what they were. Like I saw a video where somebody planted, it had something to do with raspberry bushes and keeping the bugs away. I don't know, but I think it's pretty much just the aphids. Okay, so I'm going to, since I have 12 on this side and you can see I have 11 on this side, I'm going to finish going around this uh, short side here just until I get to the very, very end. So I want to make sure it looks like I have 15 stitches on the top, 15 stitches on the bottom. And then we're going to start the sides. Or not the sides, the flap. 
So I'm just going to work all the way to that other side. And this is kind of why it almost doesn't matter if you mark your stitches, your first stitch or not. I just uh, have it. And then sometimes when I'm doing something like this where I know that first stitch really isn't going to matter, I can count uh, my rows for each side. I'll just forfeit that stitch marker. So you want it so you end so that you're directly on the side. And if you see here on that side, um, if I count my stitches, and I want to make sure I get on the sides, I want to make sure I get in between a stitch. So this is one stitch and that would be the other stitch. So you get your side directly in between a stitch. So you want it to crunch in between those stitches. That way you know you're going to have 15 on one side and 15 on the other. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. So that would be my 15th stitch. And I have an extra stitch there that I put. I'm going to take that extra stitch out. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just so like this side is nice and round. If I start here, it's in chain one, it's going to look like it's a little bit odd. So I am actually going to slip stitch into the next stitch, which is kind of almost the stitch that's um, the first stitch in the front of your little bag there. So I'm going to slip stitch that to just draw it in closer to bring the round together. So if I hold that and you see that, I have slip stitched that 16th stitch. Oh, good morning, Moon Silk. Thank you very much. I have slip stitched that 16th stitch. So now I am going to chain one. I'm going to slip stitch this. I'm going to skip the slip stitch that we just made. And then I'm going to work back in my stitches 15. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, so now if you fold it and you look at it, we're starting the flap. I am very well. How are you today? We're working on, we finished the, ba the bag tutorial. I finished my market bag tutorial. And that's up. And with the leftover yarn, if you look at, um, if you go to my YouTube channel and you see the um, thumbnail, it has like a little card pocket that's hanging off of it. That is what I'm making now. So, and I'm just going to repeat what I just did. I'm going to, and that was yarn I used for the market bags. Not this one, but the one that I did on the tutorial that was behind it. It needs to stretch out a little bit. Um, just hanging them loosens the fibers enough so that I don't have to block them. But it's a Red Heart Ombre. And this colorway is Anemone. And this is like one of my favorite yarns to make these market bags out of because it's a little bit less stretchier than some of the other acrylic yarns and I think the colors are pretty the way it just kind of like flows so that's what I'm using and I had 
just enough left over from uh, one of those skeins after I did my market bag to do this little change pocket. So I am going to just chain one and again work 15 back across. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Again, it's just a single crochet. Nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 15. And you can see how we're starting the flap that's going to fold over. So when you are doing this flap, if you want to bring it down so that it's like an envelope, you would then start decreasing on each side. I think I'm going to do one more round just to make sure that it totally covers the top. Because you can see if I put some things in it and it's a little bit bigger, uh, I want this when it's folded down, when I fold down the flap, to actually cover the top of that. So I'm going to do, ah. I gave my uh, grandson a little amigurumi. She's wor she's busy with the little amigurumi bunny. Um, I gave my grandson a little amigurumi bunny for Easter. But you can see, I don't know how well this is showing up here, but you can see if you put stuff in here and it ends up a little bit thicker. Uh, what can I stick in there? Oh, here, I'll put this in there. That's not taking a chance. So if, if I put that in there, it ends up a little bit thicker, right? So I want to make sure that this flap part is actually going to be long enough that if it's a little bit thicker, it's going to cover the top part that's open. So I want my straight stitches. I want my straight stitches when they fold over to be able to fold over that if it's a little bit bigger, if there's a if there's some few things in it. So I think I'm going to do one more, which will give me three even rows. I pulled my last stitch there a little bit too tight. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to chain one, I'm going to turn, and I'm going to work back. 15, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, so that should give me more than enough height to cover the top part of the opening of the bag. So now I'm going to untangle that knot, take a sip of my coffee, and start decreasing it. And I'm not going to do, to, it's a total point, but almost. I do love coffee. Even though I can't do the caffeine anymore, I still love coffee. Okay, so now to make it a little bit rounded and pull it together, I'm still going to chain one for my height, but then I'm going to start doing decreases. Now this is another example. I know I showed you an uh, invisible decrease a lot when we did um, the amigurumi and the dolls. I showed you the invisible decreases, but this is one of those instances where I wouldn't use it because you were going to see the stitch on this side and on this side, and the invisible decrease always looks different on the front than it does on the back. But a regular decrease 
is going to look the same from the front and the back. So I'm just going to use a regular decrease. So I am going to decrease in my first stitch. And I'm going to do a regular decrease, not the big giant decreases that I did on the market bag. So I'm just going to pull up two loops, pull up from the first chain, or pull up from the first single crochet, pull up from the, a loop from the second single crochet, and then draw through all three loops. And then I'm going to go across. So this should, since I draw, drew one together, that's one. It's kind of like two. And I'm going to work to the last two stitches. Just single crochet across to the last two stitches. And if you need to, you can put a stitch marker in your first and last stitches so that you know you're getting them even. So you're, you're getting the right uh, stitches. And then I'm down to the last two stitches, so I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to yarn over and pull up a loop. I'm going to insert my hook into the next stitch, yarn over and pull up a loop, and then I'm going to pull through all three loops. So that starts to decrease it. You can see how it starts to come in on the edges. So it's starting to come in. And I am going to do the next, the same thing on the next row. So I'm going to chain one for my height. I'm going to turn and I'm going to do insert into my stitch, pull up a loop, insert into my stitch and pull up a loop, pull through all loops and that makes my decrease. I had my finger in front of it. You'll see it the next time. And I'm going to work all the way across to the very last stitch, which was a decrease stitch and I'm going to decrease it again. So I'm down to my last two stitches. Again, I'm going to insert my hook and pull up a loop. Insert my hook and pull up a loop. Pull through all three. And that's going to give me another decrease. And if you look at it now, you can really see how much shorter it is than the inside. So it's starting to make our flaps. And I think I'm going to do that I think I'm going to do one even row next. So I'm just going to go across. I'm not going to decrease. I'm just going to go across. So two, three, four. So it's not quite so pointed. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So I'm down from 15 stitches to 11 stitches. Um, if you're doing rows of decreases and you put an even row in between your rows of decreases, it will give you a more rounder edge instead of uh, quite such a sharp angle. Like if you just kept going up with your decreases, it would give you a sharp angle to a point and down. But if you do your rows of decreases and then a row of even stitches and then a row of decreases and then a row of even stitches it would give you a more rounded look because um, I'm not going to take this all the way down to one stitch but I am going to do another round of decreases which uh, I chained one from the height of my single crochet insert my hook yarn over and pull up the loop in the first stitch same thing for the second stitch pull through all three to do my decrease and then I'm going to work across until I have two stitches left and when I have two stitches left oh you're welcome you didn't know that you're welcome um, yarn over pull up your loop Yarn over, pull up your loop, and pull through all three. And that's going to give you, it's kind of, but you can see how it's decreasing in the center there, like almost like an envelope. envelope. So you get those decreases. 
And I think that's probably, um, maybe I'll do one more row. So I think I'll do one more row of decreases. And again, I'm showing you how you can look at things and decide how you want to put them together. So you can follow me exactly, or you can like uh, take that thought process and think, hmm, well, maybe I want to do it this way. Like you could take this and you could decrease it down to a point and you could actually make a chain that you could wrap around it and tie. Uh, you can do all kinds of different things with it. So that's kind of why I talk you through what I'm doing and freehand the things so that you can see that you can um, do different things with them. So I'm going to work my way across. To the last two stitches and then I'm going to decrease and then I'm going to show you how we're going to put a nice edge around this and a loop so this is where I ended right that's where I ended I'm not going to turn my work now this is this is the way you would be looking at it I don't know, it might be backwards, but it's sort of, this This would be the right side of the fabric. So instead of turning my work, hmm, yeah, instead of turning my work, I'm now going to start to work around in a circle again. So the circle is now going to be, this is my starting loop. So the circle is now going to be down, straight down the raw edge because I'm not going to, um, I'm not going to turn. So I did approximately one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So as long as you get just as many stitches down this side as you get down this side, you're good because it's even. So I'm going to continue working down this side and then I'll show you. And I am going to mark my first stitch on this one because I do want to pay attention. So one, and wherever you can find it, I usually just put it in between the rows. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. And since I'm putting it in between the rows, I'll have one less. So now you can see I have where I left off working across the top. I did not turn. I just worked seven stitches down the edge, right? And I'm still not going to turn. I'm going to work my 15 stitches across the front because that's what we had left over. We had 15 stitches left over. Now that includes where you put that where you put that slip stitch when you first started it let's see if I can pull this apart where you put that slip stitch where you first started it you can actually just um, work that stitch right over top of that slip stitch or you can work right into that slip stitch it doesn't matter either way so you can work down into the stitch I'm trying to show you So this is where you put the slip stitch on the side. And then this is the next stitch after that slip stitch that we did. You can work over that slip stitch or you can work right into that slip stitch to do that first stitch going across. Um, oh, thanks. You learned something new to make it look neat. Thank you very much. And then you would just make sure you had your 15 stitches even across the front of it. So however you want to do it, and I'm going to count just to make sure. One, so I'm going to start counting from here, from the opposite end. So this is where I want to start, and I want to make sure I get 15 stitches across. And because I have that slip stitch there, I want to make sure that I'm just getting 15 stitches. So I'm going to start here with 
This is my side. This is the stitch that my side starts into. And this is the first stitch that nothing is in. So I'm going to start with that nothing stitch and count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. I know I have to put my first stitch right there to give me fifteen across. So that's where I'm going to put it. And then when I do it, I'll put a stitch marker there to show you. You don't have to, but I'm going to sh I just want to do it for showing purposes. So 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14, 15. So we got exactly our 15 stitches across the front. And that's why I count it that way. So I got exactly my 15 stitches across the front. And now since I did eight stitches, so that was my first one, and it's exactly 15 stitches across the front. And now I'm going to continue without turning, and the same eight stitches that I worked down this side, I'm going to work up this side. So I'm just going to go into the sides of the stitches wherever they fit. One, oh, I worked seven stitches. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. I worked seven stitches up the front. Okay. So now, and I'm still not going to fasten off, I'm going to do one more thing. So I've worked my seven stitches up the side. As you can see, there's my seventh stitch where my yarn's coming out. Um, you can see, if I move this over, um, this, which looks like a little tiny stitch, was the stitch that I made to increase my height because I should have nine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven. Seven across the top, because I did enough decreases, it's always going to be odd. So I have seven across the top. So I'm going to go into this next stitch here, which is the first stitch across here. And since I have seven, I'm going to do three slip stitches. So I'm not going to turn. And you'll see how this pulls together. So I'm going to do three slip stitches and I am going to mark the first slip stitch. So I just slip stitched into that first stitch there. That's one slip stitch. I can take this one off because I already showed you. And actually I think what I'm going to do is where that one was, I'm going to count across the front. I'm going to count across the front so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'll just make it even. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I would skip one because I have an odd number of stitches. So that's seven. And I'm going to put my stitch marker in the center of the front, just so I know where the center is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this is going to be my side. So I'm now going to work my slip stitch to the, what I said it was, seven. So one, two, three slip stitches brings me to the center of three slip stitches brings me to the center of the top. Right? So if I did three slip stitches on this side, if I did three slip stitches on this side, there would be that one in the middle because three and three is six and the odd one out is seven. That's my middle stitch. 
Does that make sense so far? You'll see why in a minute. Because I'm going to take and I'm going to make that fourth. And you can see how that puts like a little, like a finishing edge on the top. So you can see the slip stitches. That's my edge with the slip stitch. So it makes it like just a little bit thicker and gives it like a little bit of an edge to it. Whereas this is my edge without the slip stitches. It's just kind of like the edge. So this gives it like almost like an I cord look by putting the slip stitches in it. Okay, so we're in that fourth stitch and that fourth stitch is that middle stitch. And I have, what I'm going to use, uh, let me see if I can find them. Ah, this is what I'm going to use. And you can consult your old button jar, or you can buy a button for it. I am consulting my button, this thing. And sometimes I have these because I live on the lake. Sometimes I'll use these. Uh, sometimes I use these, which are little buttons. You're basically looking for a button. Um, but I want a button that's just a little bit bigger that I know that's going to hold the hook. So I'm going to pick this button, not to mention, like, I mean, ooh, it's shiny. So that's the button that I'm going to use. But again, you know, I could reach down and I can consult everything's within arm's reach. I can consult my old button jar. <laughs> Or I knew I had these buttons, and I think this is the this is the button that I used for the other one. Um, but it, it just it's a little bit bigger, so it'll hold the chain, and um, it doesn't have a shank, but it's kind of diamond shaped. I don't know if you can tell that it's kind of diamond shaped, so that when you do put it on, it's almost like there's a shank there. Um, a shank would be the little loop on the back side of the button. So instead of just sewing it through the holes, you would sew it through the loop on the little bit of back of the button. If you've noticed, some buttons have that loop, and uh, some buttons just have holes. That little loop on the back is called a shank. Um, if you use buttons with a shank when you're using a loop to close your buttons, uh, it works a little bit bigger because it adds the little bit of um, that little bit of height in between the button and the the fabric so that your um, chain stitch will nicely um, so that your chain stitch will nicely words slip around that button but not come off it'll have enough space where it holds that okay anyway so now I just want to chain enough that I think I'm going to be able to slip over that button. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, and I don't know if that's going to be enough. So to make sure it's enough, I'm going to do five. I'm going to slip stitch in the same stitch. So in that same fourth stitch, I'm going to slip stitch in that same one. I'm just going to insert my hook for right now, just so that I can take this button and see if this button will fit through here. And it does. I might actually be able to get away with one less stitch. Two, three, four, five. I could probably get away with four stitches. So I'm going to take one stitch out. And again, where I put that slip stitch, I'm going to put that in there just to hold it just to see if I can still get my button through there. It's okay if it's it's okay if it's a little bit tight because it will stretch. So I'm going to take my button. It's finicky. But yes, I can take that loop and I can slip it over top of that button. And it's still a little bit tight. So again, you, I can I'm trying to get give you a good picture here. So I can take the loop, and that's why I didn't keep going, because I wanted to make sure that my chain loop I was going to be able to put over top of my button. 
and my button was going to slide through it, but it wasn't going to be too big. So the button just barely fits, and that's what I want, that button to just barely fit. So I'm going to go ahead and complete that slip stitch in that same fourth chain. So that's my loop for my button. And then I'm going to, that's what it would look like from your edge, and you see with your slip stitches across, uh, it gives you that nice edge and like a flatter edge on the top than just like a raw edge that it gives you here. So it gives you a more finished edge on both sides actually. So I am now going to keep going in the same direction. I'm going to slip stitch in the last three of the top and we're almost done in the last three of the top. This is where I started down the side I'm going to keep going. I don't need that stitch marker anymore. I'm going to keep going and just slip stitch down just uh, like we did before. Just make your, sure your slip stitch is the same size as your stitch so that it doesn't curl the edge. So make sure you pull your slip stitch the same size as your stitch so that it doesn't curl your edge. So continue working to the side. And when you get to the side, and this is really just your preference. Um, when I get to the side, I am then going to do sort of the same thing I did for this. I am going to chain, I think I wanted a little bit more on the side so I'll do the next one. And again, this is like totally optional and totally if you want to do it or not, um, but you can see we have so far our uh, stitches going across the top like a change purse, our slip stitches going down the side, we have our loop for our button, so now I'm on the side. And I think I'm actually going to put my loop that I'm going to do on the other side of that. So I'm going to go across, that was my one. You can do it on either side, but I'm going to do it on the second side. Two, I'm going to work across with my slip stitches. Three, four, five, six, seven, that was the eighth stitch, so I know that's the middle. eight, one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm almost there. I know I, I know it should be seven, but I'm going to leave it at six for right this very second and I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. And again, this is totally optional and up to you. Um, you think by now, after weeks, I would learn to be prepared. Like I said, it's not studio quality. but you may actually learn something. Okay, so right where we are there now, I'm gonna leave it right there. So we did everything but the last stitch across the front and they are all slip stitches. So you can see the edge that it gives you now on your piece at the top. It gives you like a, like a finished edge and then your loop for your button. And give me one second because I know where to grab the things that I want. And I'm going to show you an optional way to close it. Um, oh, here we are.
So you can do one of two things. You can chain. Oh, you're welcome, Moon Silk. I do not mind sharing at all. Okay, so you can do one of two things. This is some of the hardware I have. This is probably the easy one, which is just a simple key ring. You don't have to go anywhere, but like you can find them at the holler, dollar store or the hardware or whatever. So you can, now that you've gotten to the side, you can slip stitch in the seventh one, and I'll show you both ways. So you can slip stitch in that last stitch on the side. You can... Like just do a smaller loop, like maybe eight or ten. And then come back down and slip stitch into the same place where you started your chain. So if you did it that way, you can slip stitch in the same way you started your chain. And then this here, you can take and you can put your key ring on. So you could slide a clip on so that you could clip it to something. You can do it that way or... You can, I'm going to take this out, including um, the chain in number six. If you have hardware that you want to use, like this is just a little D-clip, I would prefer to use a round, um, I would prefer to use a round clip, but I don't think it'll be big enough. And I'm going to actually go through this D ring I'm going to take out number six as well so I'm going to go through this D ring and I'm going to put it on there so I'm slip stitching so I'm putting it on there and I'm slip stitching the last two stitches into it so one I don't know if you can tell that so I just slipped stitched right through it I'll show you again So you would put your D-ring on your hook, get your stitch, and you would go into your stitch, and you would do your slip stitch. It's hard to see from the other side. Right over top of your D-ring, and then you can go underneath your D-ring. and slip stitch the next stitch and you've attached your ring. So I would typically, if I was going to do this method, I would uh, use a round piece so that it didn't look like that D. Uh, you could also, instead of slip stitching it, You could take it and put it right on the side there where you wanted it, right on the side where you wanted it, and you could go in and you would have to go into your hook, so you would have to turn it down this way. This is going to be finicky to show you. So if you turn your D-ring this way over the last two stitches on the side, Last two stitches on the side. Line them up there. Your last two stitches on the side. Okay? You can take that D ring and just do two single crochets. And I know it gives it a little bit of height, but that's okay. You can pull them tight. So you've done one single crochet into the loop for the first D-ring, and you can do the second single crochet, whoops, sorry, you can go into the D-ring, into the stitch, and then pull the second single crochet up. And you have single crocheted around that D-ring like it was part of the stitches. Yes, no, you want me to show you that again? I'm not sure who else here to watch that.
So the first method is definitely easier, where you would just make a loop, and you would um, you would just make a loop, and then just put your key ring on it. But you could, if you wanted, instead of doing slip stitches in that last two, in those last two stitches on the side there. This is our top. Those are the last two stitches on the side, or first two. Okay, and you would just do a couple single crochets. And now what you're going to do, what I'm going to do, in that very last stitch that I used to make my single crochet, I'm going to put another slip stitch and I'm going to pull it tight. So I just put a slip stitch and I pulled it tight. And now I'm going to chain 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, maybe 20, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So I've got a chain of 20. There's my D-ring. I have a chain of 20. And then I'm going to take my hook. I'm going to insert my hook into my, I should say hook into my hook, my clasp. And I'm just going to pull that through like a slip stitch. So I split my yarn. <clears throat> At least I'm not barking yet. So I've got that on there like that, and I'm just going to take this. That's tight on that hook. If you need to use a smaller hook to do it, maybe I should show you with the smaller hook. That way you can see it a little bit better. Okay, so you have your yarn on your hook. You put your clasp on your hook, you do another chain, and you've got that stuck in there like that. And then I'm going to turn it, and I'm going to slip stitch back down that chain. So I'm going to turn it and hold it, and wherever you can get it in there, you're just going to slip stitch back down that chain. Again, when you're slip stitching back down a chain or over top of stitches for like an edge, you want to make sure that uh, you're keeping your slip stitches the same size as your chain stitch or your top stitches so that it doesn't curl. So I'm just going to slip stitch those stitches all the way back down. And yes, I know I'm still using my smaller hook. I'll just keep it a little bit tighter. That stitch needed to be a little bit bigger. The chain was a little bit bigger than the slip stitch I made, so I'm going to take that out and just adjust it. Just pull it up a little bit so that I can adjust it to the fit of the chain that I did so that it doesn't curl. I'm going through two loops. You can go through one loop if you want. If you go through the top two loops, it makes it more look more like an eye cord. So if you go through the top two loops, it makes it look more like an I-cord. If you go through just the top loop, so if you go through the top two loops, it makes it look more like an I-cord when you're doing your slip stitches down your chain. If you put it just through the top loop, it makes it more look more like a, um, uh, a flat piece. So I'm just going to stitch all the way down slip stitch all the way down there with my little clasp hanging off of there. You guys see where I'm going with this? I hope it wasn't too confusing. But I do like to show you different ways. That way if you want to do things different ways. But definitely the easiest way to do it is to make a chain, another chain loop on this side of the pocket and just slip a key ring on it. But of course, why should I do that? So I'm going to go all the way down to the end. So I'm all the way down and I slip stitched in the very last one. And then instead of slip stitching where I uh, started that slip stitch, which I can, but I've already put two stitches in there so I don't want it to be too big of a hole. I'm just going to slip stitch into the next stitch. And 
and then we haven't done any slip stitches up this side yet this is where we started our round of slip stitches so I'm going to slip stitch up to that top there where we started So you go all the way up to the top. I slip stitched into that. This is our first one where we slip stitched. And um, at this point, I'm going to cut my tail a little bit long and just pull it through. So now you can see you have your little change purse here. You can adjust where you want to put your button. And you know your loop is going to slide over top of your button. And then, depending on how you did this side here, you can take this and clip it to the D-loop. It's still going to slide through. I could have done three single crochets over that. You can just attach it to your D-loop there. Like I said, I do like to use a round loop instead. Um, I'm not very fond of the D-loops, unless I'm doing like wide straps for purses, but that's what I had. Um, so that it clips and unclips or you can just make your chain loop and put a key ring on that you can slide a hook onto that you can hook it onto something else which is much more easy um, I may end up taking this out and doing that just that um, but what I'm going to do at the end of this and I'm going to take this out because you know this is the beginning stitch almost done I'm going to slide this onto my needle slide my needle onto my yarn and then I'm going to take where that stitch is and I'm going to go see if I can get it it all kind of looks mashed up here if I hide that I'm going to pull it so that I can go into this stitch And it pulls down over top of the stitch and then I'm going to go back into the same stitch and I'm going to pull it down I'm going to weave it down so I went back into the same stitch so I pull you can see where I pull see where it pulls there hold on see where it pulls it pulls right down beside that loop there And then I'm going to go into that first, that uh, last stitch again. And then this time when I go into that last stitch, I'm going to weave it down a couple of stitches on the wrong side of the fabric. Just a couple. So now when I pull the top, it's going to pull it closed and it's going to look like another stitch. Now the slip stitches look a little bit different because they do look like it might be a stitch beside a stitch um, but it's definitely going to give you a neater look than a knot. And then just make sure you don't pull it too tight and then you can knot it here on the wrong side of the fabric. You can knot it here on the wrong side of the fabric and uh, then just weave it in. So I'm going to take it and I'm going to knot it just over top of a loop. I'm just going to take it over top of a loop somewhere to tie my knot. And I'm just going to make a loop. I'm going to put it through again and make another loop. Pull that tight and I'm going to put it through a third time. And you can actually cinch that down. And that makes a knot good enough that it's going to hold. And then I would just take that and whichever way your knot is leaning because you'll notice your knot's going to lean one way or another. So if I hold it this way, that's not really the way it's going to lean. It leans more this way. So that's the way. Oh, maybe it is leaning that way. Maybe it's leaning down. So whichever way your knot is going to have a tendency to lean. Because you can see when I pushed it down, it wants to lean this way. So that's the way I'm going to start weaving my end in. And I'm just going to go over a few strands 
and I'm going to pull it down. And because you pulled it in the same direction that the knot wants to lay, the knot will tend to either disappear in the stitching or it will actually slide underneath the loops there. And then I'm going to take this and I'm just going to weave it through this row, like right in those stitches. Make sure I can see you guys. So like right in the middle of the stitches like that, I'm going to take that and I'm going to weave my needle right into the middle of those stitches. Um, about to the point where it went in. So if it went, so if it went in here, I want to weave it all the way across. Just in case, if you see that little bit of extra string there, it kind of looks even, like you meant to pull it that way. And if it's a little bit tough, then you can see where it goes in and where it goes out. It's kind of even here. So if it makes the fabric a little bit thicker, it's only making it th thicker there and it's a little bit more even. And don't pull it too tight, just tight enough. And then you would take it and you would just clip the end. But I'm not gonna clip the end because I'm gonna take this out and make my, my loop for my um, key ring. I did this to show you guys, but I am gonna take that out to do a loop for a key ring because I don't like the way that, I don't know. I don't know if I like the way that hangs or not. Hmm. So that's how you would finish it. And then you would take your button and you would just take your, I don't know if you guys know how to shank a button, but I'll show you how to shank this button. So you would just take your length of yarn and it doesn't have to be too much. And I know say, sewing a button may not be seem like it's something that's uh, that you can do different things with but you can actually because you want to make sure that you have enough room like I said uh, like I explained with the shanks on the buttons and the loops on the buttons you want to make sure that this is going to fit and the thickness is going to have enough um, enough to fit over top of that button and not slide off because the loop is too thick to fit around your button so I'm going to show you how if you used a flatter button how you can do what's called shanking your button. So I will lean this down here a little bit so that you can see. So I'm going to decide where I want my button. And that's probably a good place to put it. So I want to make sure it's in the center. And I want to make sure things aren't twisted. So first and foremost, that looks twisted. I want to make sure I kind of get my flap so that my flap is totally in the back and it doesn't look twisted. And once I get it totally in the back so that it doesn't look twisted, then I'm going to fold it over and decide that, again, I'm going to leave those couple of rows there so it gives it a little bit of room. And then I'm going to decide where I want my button. So that's about where I want my button. That would be in the center. So I'm going to hold it there. Now because I'm eventually going to tie it off, I'm not going to worry about the end. I'm going to slide my needle. I don't know if this needle is going to go through here. Oh no. But I'm going to... Kind of just figure out where you're... Figure out where the hole is. You can actually go down this way if you want, but I don't think this this needle is. That's why it's not working. This needle is not going to fit through that through that uh, button there. Let me see what I might have that I can use. Um. You can always use thread. But I'm going to show you, what do I have over here? I don't know. A milliner's needle, maybe? You can use embroidery thread. I don't know if I'll be able to get this whole thing of yarn through this needle here, but I'm going to try. Because I know this needle will go through this button. All trial and error. Sometimes when you're trying to 
here it is. Uh, don't laugh. Yes, I have this on my table. Uh, if you're trying to uh, thread a thicker needle or a thicker piece of thread through a thinner needle, sometimes you can take a little bit of this and um, you can put it on the end of your thread to hold it together. You just need the tiniest little bit to wax it and then you can um, it will kind of stay together a little bit better so that your ends won't fray. Um, so let me see if I can get this yarn into this needle and I should with a little bit of chapstick on it. That little bit of chapstick sometimes makes all the difference if you're trying to get a thick piece of yarn through a thin needle. And I did it. And you see how thick that yarn is in that needle. It just barely fits in that needle. But that little teeny tiny bit of chapstick on the end. Uh, sometimes if I'm doing a lot of this, I'll actually just put some chapstick on my lips instead of like lipstick. Um, I love my lipstick though. And that way I can get my uh, thicker yarn through my smaller needle. Okay, so now I should be able to get my needle up through my button. Hold it up here. Let's see. Where do I want to come up? That's where I want to come up. Okay, so this needle will go through this button. I know it fits through this button. There it goes. Save your fingers. Use a pair of pliers if you can't, if your thread's tight. Why is this? Oh, I got it looped through the end there. That's why it was giving me such a hard time. Okay, so I'm going to pull this through the first part of the button, and I'm going to leave a good length there. That's probably about five inches or so, so that I can tie off that knot inside the bag and I have the first loop through the button. So again, I'm gonna smash it flat to make sure I'm getting it where I want it before I do that second loop. And I do, so I'm gonna put my needle back down through there. And kind of make sure you get into a stitch. Like not just into like the hole of a stitch, or the hole between the stitches, but actually get into a piece of yarn. So not into a hole of the stitch, but actually into like a piece of yarn. So you have something to hold it onto. You also don't want it to come out the same place. So if you look where I have this coming out, I have some strands between where this one comes out and where this one comes out so that when I knot it, um, so that when I knot it, Um, it's over something. So I'm just go then going to pull that so that it's tight. And I'm probably not going to get that yarn through there a second time, but that's okay. Um, so if you've got a flat button and the button is super tight here, it's going to be hard for that chain to go around that button because it's super tight to here. So to shank that button, to give yourself a little bit of space so that your chain stitch will actually um, sit underneath that button and hold tight, you are then going to take the same needle that you're working with and you're going to take it in a different spot than it came from and you're going to go up. You can actually put this through the hole if you want. The hole of the stitch if you want and you're going to come up not through the button but underneath the button very close to where you stitched it on so you can see where I stitched it on and I'm coming up very close underneath that button so you're going to pull your yarn back up again you still have a tail that's inside so you can sew so you're going to pull that yarn back up through that button You're going to pull your tail down so it doesn't get too loose and you're going to hold it. 
and then you're going to do what's called shanking your button. So you're going to take this thread that you just brought up underneath it and you're going to wrap it around that stitch that you made. So I'm going to wrap it around there like four times and pull it pretty tight. And you can see where you've wrapped your loops around that button. You've created like a post almost that's going to now when you take this and thread it back down through here anywhere and then pull it tight wrapping those threads around kind of created a post underneath your button where your chain stitch will slip easily over top of it and hold underneath the button and not flip off because um, it's too uh, the button is too close to there so that is called shanking the button. So you've actually created like an artificial shank there to give yourself room for that chain stitch loop. Yes, it lifts. We call that anchoring the button. Okay. It lifts up for the button. Yes. That's exactly what I did there. So it just lifts the button up a little bit. So that's another trick. But the chapstick trick works like amazing if you want to thread something really large and you think to yourself, I know I can fit that through there, but the ends are kind of like uh, ridiculous. Am I missing other comments here? Oh, you thought it would split the yarn. Okay, no, I don't think I missed any other. But yeah, Patty, that's basically what I'm doing, anchoring the button. Shanking the button. I guess it depends on which... Um, which fiber art you're doing they call it something different my mother would probably call it anchoring the button as well um, and then I'm going to take my ends and I'm just going to tie a knot like a square knot right over left under and out left over right under and out and you guys know my obsession with glue it's sitting here but you know, I've lost the cap, so that's a lost cause. It just kind of self-seals. So you guys know, all know my obsession with glue and finishing things off that I want to make sure stay. So after I've got my first and uh, got my second, I'm just going to take just the tiniest drop of glue. Uh, quite literally. Whoops, that was not the tiniest drop of glue. Okay. Just the tiniest. Try that again. Just literally the tiniest drop of glue and put it on there before I finish tying that knot. So the second part of the knot is actually over top of the glue. So all you did was put like the tiniest drop of, and again, that's um, my favorite, my permanent fabric glue. And then you can just take those ends where you did those buttons and I would weave one end this way and one end this way all the way to the side of the bag. And I would try to go through the same row. So from the inside, I would take one thread with my needle and weave it all the way through this row to the end. And then the other side, depending on which um, way your knot goes and which way your threads want to go, I would go through the same row and on the other side and do it all the way to the, to the side, to the end. And that's my, oh, I already wove that one in, so I'm going to cut that one off there on the top. So if you're, oh, I did say I wasn't going to cut that off. Oh, well, it can stay like this. So there is your little card pocket didn't take us very long a little loop on the end and your button will fit or your uh, chain loop you've measured it so you know it'll fit over and it will stretch with time so uh, you want it to just fit over top of there which it does but this button is a little bit rough on the edges and because you anchored or shanked that button 
It gives you enough height that your chain loop fits underneath there and won't slide up. And you can take your either your key ring with your little hook, and you can buy lanyard clips. Thank you. You can buy um, like uh, little lanyard clips as well. So if you just want to do a chain loop down this way and put um, put your key ring on it, you can buy little lanyard clips, and they're actually pretty cheap. Um, let me show you what they look like. The lanyard clips. So that you could then clip it to something if you wanted to do that instead. Or get a bigger hook clip that you could just put around that key ring. You could use the same, you could use this same type of hook and just slide it onto your key ring so that you could clip onto things. This would probably fit better around the edge of that bag. This is the one that we did. Here's my thread. So this is the bag that we did. And I used the end of the yarn. If you used a clip like this on the end of your key ring, it would fit over this. You could mash that in there so you could get that in there. Um, and fit that that way if you used it on the just on the key ring, but I like to You might need a little bit bigger of a hook uh, All right, let me just throw everything around or if you do it this way you can loop it around and You can loop it around your handle And hook it um, if you wanted to make sure that it was secured a little bit better. So that's how you would make like a basic change purse. If you, and you can always make this longer if you want. You can always, um, thank you. Very cute. Thank you. It turned out really nice. Thank you. Uh, you can, um, take these rows here and you can start as soon as you do your decrease row, do an even row. Then do another decrease row, then do another uh, even row, then do another decrease row, then do another e increase row. You can do it that way to make this flap a little bit longer. Put your even rows in between each decrease row, or you can um, just decrease all the way down and it would come to about here by the time you decreased all the way down. And then when you would do that as you're working your slip stitches, you would just make your little loop for your button on the very end of the point. Uh, you could also, with this, if you were going to really use it with your market bag, you could make this chain loop much longer so that when you opened your bag, you could actually, the chain loop would then hang your bag down inside so that people couldn't just like grab it from like this angle. So you could make that chain loop much much longer uh, so that you could do it that way and you could also if you were using um, there went my words again if you were using a key ring you can open your key ring wide enough and you could use a pair of scissors or you could use your crochet hook there's another safety pin somebody's going to step on you could use a smaller crochet hook to open that a little bit wider so that you could actually take that and loop it not only around this let me show you and then I'm done not only around this Darn it. I just realized what the text message was that was there. Oh. Okay. So again, not only could, could you loop it around. There, that works better. 
around this part Look, you get her done any way you can. So not only could you loop it around that part, you could then take it and fold it apart. That needs to be wider. Pull it apart and loop this whole strap around it. So that you then had it's just so you can see yes it will work it's just how desperate you are to get that apart you can actually get your key ring on it if you want to do that method um, other things that you could do to make things work and these are just things to think about while you're doing it is if you do want a key ring on it you can always when you're making your handle and you make your initial chain put your yarn through here and put your chain through there initially so that this is already on there but uh, I mean honestly it didn't take really that much to put that key ring on both of those hooks there but so what do you guys think? I think that turned out pretty well. And like I said, you can make this chain a little bit bigger so that hangs down lower in the bag if you would if you want. Or you can make it shorter so it just hangs on the side of the bag if you wanted. But uh, yeah, that's a quick and easy way to make a little change purse. And if you did want to line it, to measure it for the lining, oh, this is going to take like three hours for TikTok to decide it, to decide it wants to upload this or process this. Um, I know I'm just chattering, chattering and chattering. Oh my God, 10 new messages. How'd they go? Got to go, everyone. You guys, too, have a good weekend. It's beautiful. Thank you, Meredith. Have a blessed day. It's supper time for me. Oh, enjoy your supper. Have a great weekend. So I'll have to watch the replay. Okay, not a problem. But the only thing I was going to say is if you wanted to line this, the way you would measure a lining was that you would come down here and then you would come up this way. And that's how you would measure it. And then you would just cut your arch there and you would just hem your fabric and stitch it all the way around there like that. And that would be an easy way to do it. Thank you very much, Glenda. Thank you for everybody that watched me. Thank you for everybody that uh, gave me the likes and helped out there. And I appreciate it. Uh, I hope that was helpful. And I do believe we decided that today is Friday, right? Yes. The next week we're going to do some sort of bucket bags. Bucket hats. Bucket hats. Thank you everybody for joining me and I will see you on Monday. I do this Monday through Friday. I teach something. So Monday I will be back and we will be working on bucket hats. Thank you very much.